happens. Now, in the Potter situation, which is related to this image, the one that's up here, the, the idea is that everything that's stable re rests on something that's unstable and dangerous. And that's underneath in the Potter series. And then the other thing that happens continually in the series, but particularly in the second episode, particularly in the second episode, is that Potter has to go down beneath things to encounter something that's terrifying and deadly, that's, that's actually preying on his friends and on the community. So it's, uh, it's very much like, for example, the Hobbit having to go off and, and, and uh, steal treasure from, from Smog, I think the dragon's name is, and except that in the, in the Potter sequence, the dragon, which is the basilisk, their, their equivalent, it's the same thing as this. Um, in, the, in the Hobbit, the dragon hoards gold, whereas in the Potter representation, what does the basilisk guard? What's it, what is it captured? It's the little red-headed girl. Yeah. Right, Ginny, <laughs> Ginny, right. And that's a very, that's a very old story. Now, now Potter's kind of in love with her, right? Now, I mean, it's, it's, they're young and sort of platonic, but you know, you can see the relationship sort of burgeoning. Now, he has to confront this thing that's terrifying that exists underneath everything in order to free this virginal figure from the clutches of something terrible and reptilian. Now, it's a very, very interesting story, that. And what it means, a whole variety of things. And what it means to some degree is that uh, a male human being can't really become mature until he confronts the terrible things that lie underneath the civilized veneer of society. That's one thing it means. Uh, another thing it means is that it's the capacity it's the capacity of the male in that situation to do that that makes him attractive enough to wake up the females that he might be associated with. So that's like a Sleeping Beauty motif. Um, it has e e evolutionary echoes because much of what we've battled with for the last 60 million years, say, because I think you could trace the development of our cognitive structures quite straightforwardly back 60 million years, there's been an endless battle between human beings and predators, and many of those predators were reptilian. And so, you know, we're the result of a very, very long battle between mammals and reptiles. And in our case, particularly, it appears that part of the reason we evolved our tool using capacity and our great capacity for vision was because our ancestors were continually preyed upon by predatory snakes when they lived in trees. And that's a long time ago. And so these these symbolic representations are unbelievably archaic and they're kind of as archaic as the underlying biological systems in your brain that, that provide you with motivation and emotion and those are extremely old. You share those with, well you share those with any animal that you have any hope whatsoever of understanding at all. And that even means lizards. You know, my daughter had these lizards that were called, I can't remember unfortunately, they're a desert kind of lizard good initial pet, but they're, they're very funny little creatures because they, they, you know, they're very lizard-like, being that they're lizards and they have points all over them. <laughs> and uh, if you put them in water, they puff themselves up, which is quite fun, and then they zoom around in the water. But more importantly, they like to stack on top of each other. They're very, very social and they're friendly, which is not exactly something that you'd expect from a lizard. But, but my, my point is that even something that's as distant as that from you in the evolutionary hierarchy shares enough commonality of biological structure with you so that you can understand a fair bit of its motivation. So for example, it's pretty easy to tell when one of those lizards, even though they're basically friendly, gets angry because it'll puff up and hiss and you know right away. You don't have to have a discussion with the rest of your family to figure out that that's an angry lizard, right? It's, it's, you, it maps onto your body immediately. And you know, the same thing applies to snakes, it even applies to insects. Lots of insects have developed the kind of warning behavior that will immediately signal to you that you're about to be bitten, or, or it's usually bitten with insects. So, so, this is all to say that there are levels of understanding that are underneath, say, your, your, your normative, mundane, day-to-day -day comprehension that inform everything that you do with deep levels of meaning. And, and lo a lot of the activities that you pursue that you might regard as entertaining actually draw on those representations and you find them entertaining because they're actually deeply meaningful. 
You know, the idea that a man can be swallowed or a human being, because there are myths like the myth of Persephone, where the protagonist is clearly female, where they, 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 there's an underground journey and then a reemergence. And, and that's the journey to the underworld. That's the journey that Harry Potter undertakes continually, by the way, throughout the Potter series. Um, the underworld taking different forms um, as, the, as the series progress. Um, now, that's also a death and rebirth idea. And, and that's, that's a very old and profound idea. And it, it's actually one of the most profound ideas that human beings have. And it's the idea that um, you will spend time in your life underground. Now, you might think, well, what does that mean? Well, it means what the Potter movie, the second Potter movie, was trying to represent, which is that there will be times in your life where you are faced with things that will terrify you into paralysis. And that will take you underneath your normal set of assumptions. Because when your normal set of assumptions are functioning, you don't end up facing something that's terrifying enough to, to freeze you. When your normal set of assumptions are working, the world stays happily predictable around you. And most of the time, that's where you are, and that's the normal world. But that's blown apart whenever something that you're attempting to do fails in a, in a dramatic or less dramatic way. The more dramatic the way, the deeper you go into the underworld. And the underworld is, in some sense, the substructures of your presuppositions. Now, you, you know this already, because I don't suppose there's a single person in here who hasn't spent some time in the underworld, so to speak, because this is what happens when something terrible happens to you, unpredictable and terrible. And, you know, there's sort of classic categories of events that send you to the underworld, you know, um, the death of someone you love, a serious illness of some sort, either for you or for someone you love, um, the death of a dream of some sort, you know, so you've got some goal that you think is really important, and all of a sudden you find out for one reason or another that there's just no way you're going to be able to pursue it. Um, betrayal, that's a really good one. People, that's a really rough one, and that'll send you for, that'll throw you for a loop for sure. So they're all, they're all elements of the part of the world that you can't control, that in some sense always remains beyond your control, that has in some sense a predatory relationship to you because it can devour you, at least metaphysically. And when that happens, you go somewhere, and the place that you go is very dangerous. It's underneath everything, and maybe you come back out. And if you come back out, what that means is that you've reconstructed your erroneous presupposition so that you can function once again in the world. And, but maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. So people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, they go into the underworld and they just stay there. And, you know, and if you're, if you're chronically depressed or if you can't get over your grief or if you're in a state of continual anxiety and upset, or if you're nihilistic for that matter, you exist essentially in an underworld domain because you can't master the perceptual apparatus, the culturally informed perceptual apparatus that would help you um, orient yourself in the world so that the things that you want to have happen and that you need to have happen actually happen. So that's what that picture means. It also means, at least in principle, that you know people have the capacity to die and be reborn at different levels of analysis. So you know there are minor disappointments that you encounter when you have to drop some presupposition that you have and let it die, and then put a new one in its place, and that's painful. But it's nowhere near as painful as holding on to the things when they don't work, because then you just end up wandering around as sort of a cladded collection of dead presuppositions and. You know, nothing that you ever want will happen under that circumstance because you're 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 armed with tools that don't fit the world. And you know, when you try to apply them, the world won't do what you want it to do, and then that's endlessly anxiety-provoking and frustrating. So part of pain is, is part of the price that you pay in some ways for being updatable, you know, because the world transforms around you and as a consequence you have to be able to transform with it. Otherwise, it runs ahead of you and you get left behind. And, you know, that happens to people to some degree anyways as they age. That's actually one of the evolutionary explanations for why people die. Because it's a mystery, right? There, there are elements of you that are immortal. You know, the, the cells that, 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 that give, give rise to you are immortal. They're, you know, the DNA that produced you is at least three and a half billion years old. It might be older than that. So structures can maintain themselves over unbelievably vast expanses of time. So it's not self-evident why human beings have to die, but we do, and we die at about after you're done being a grandparent. It's kind of 
when you're when you're done. And the, the hypothesis is is that at that point, in some sense, it's too costly to keep you updated, and you have to be replaced by a younger version, which would of course be your grandchildren or whatever.